I don't want to run too, too far into lunch, so we might get started on the next session and then people can filter in as they finish up in their other sessions. So for this next session, we're going back to banking and we'll be looking at what happens when traditional banks and fintechs work together. And I know this has been um, a topic that's been quite talked about um, at Intersect already. But the future of fintech really doesn't have to be a them versus us context, but it can be a mutually beneficial relationship between established banks and up and coming startups. In this session, we hear from Justin Brown from ANZ, <laughs> Emily Nicholas from NAB, and David Washbrook from Look Who's Charging about the benefits of collaboration and how it can help solving real problems. This session is moderated by Jennifer Harrison from Reputation Edge. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much. Um, a major theme of this year's Intersect is FinTech Bank collaboration and we have one of the industry's big success stories here on stage at the moment. So on stage with me are David Washbrook, co-founder of Look Who's Charging. Hello David. Hi Jennifer. And also Emily Nicholas who is head of digital engagement at NAB. Hello. Hello, and Justin Brown, who is Product Owner Digital Innovation at ANZ. Hello. Hello, wonderful. David, let's start with you. Can you tell us, please, for people who don't know Look Who's Charging, give us the elevator pitch. Yeah, so Look Who's Charging is all about providing deep enrichment of bank statement data. We can provide up to 80 different data points on the merchant behind a transaction. We deliver this data via APIs primarily to financial institutions. So anyone who banks with, with NAB, with ANZ, with Westpac, with about 20 other banks in the Australian market, if you look at your app and you see some nice pretty logos and, and names and, and map icons, that's Look Who's Charging providing that data. Wonderful. Let's understand a little bit more about the problem you solve for and how you're using technology to do it. Yeah, so I think the problem is pretty easy to understand. Everyone's experienced the issue of looking at your bank statement and half the time it may as well be written in a language you don't understand. You, you might look at it, you see RM Williams PTY Limited. You, you think, you know, you've been out buying new boots. You don't remember doing that. Um, you know, so you might turn, you turn to Google, it'll tell you it's a boot company. You, you turn to the bank, they can't often help you and it's a new KFC restaurant that's opened on Collins Street in Melbourne. Um, so an incredibly um, sort of frustrating issue, both for consumers and banks alike, um, you know, results in a lot of um, sort of inadvertent friendly fraud, cards getting cancelled. Um, a big expensive problem for the banks and it sucks up a lot of resources. Um, so Look Who's Charging was really born to solve that specific problem. Um, we've since moved on to numerous other use cases of the data set. Um, that's where the company was born. Um, uh, and around technology, it's an entirely cloud-based business. Um, I think you know the re it was built you know, using a, a handful of JB Hi-Fi laptops um, to build the business, which is probably testament to what you can do in this day and age. Um, a decade ago, you probably wouldn't be able to do that, but to build a, you know, build a business that's now processing three billion transactions a month with you know, bank-level enterprise-grade security on you know, seven, eight thousand dollars of hardware. Um, pretty incredible thing. It is incredible. Now, if you could go back, please, to 2017, um, look who's charging, very first client was one of Australia's biggest banks, it was NAB. David, how did that happen? Yeah, well, we, we sort of first started off enriching a few thousand transactions a month via our, our website to the public. Um, we were initially thinking about dealing with accounting companies or even direct to consumers. Um, there was probably a bit of a chance meeting at a Visa pitch event um, where we got to meet um, a couple of people from NAB and um, sort of one thing led to another and neither myself or, or Stuart or other co-founder have any experience in enterprise sales or dealing with banks and you know from that first meet um, to go live took about seven months and at the time we were thinking geez how can it take so long but you know four and a half years into it with some other banks <laughs> we're now like wow I can't believe that was so quick. Um, yeah, and then one thing um, sort of led to another, quickly started working with ANZ afterwards and, and now it's got 40 projects across 25 different banks. Amazing, well done. Um, Emily, can you tell us from NAB's perspective, what is it about the Look Who's Charging solution that makes it interesting for you? Oh, I think Dave um, touched on it before, it's like solving a clear customer pain point and that's kind of the starting point for us, you know, our call centre deal with that transaction, not recognise, query, you know, is one of the probably top reasons that our card customers call through to the bank. Um, so that kind of, the starting with that customer problem and then looking at what the actual solution does is probably um, 
yeah, really understandable. So as we sort of take that and socialise that internally, it's quite an easy message to kind of sell through the NAB ecosystem and understand why we would partner with um, Look Who's Charging to solve that core problem. Mm. Great, thank you. And Justin, from another big bank's perspective, can you tell us a little bit about the decision to buy a solution in rather than build it? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, we spent a fair bit of time on this uh, internally, sort of working out whether we wanted to go down, I suppose, the, the fintech or the, the, the uh, external path. Um, there are a few sort of areas in the bank where we obviously had this data, um, and it was very accurate data, um, but as Dave has explained, accuracy doesn't always mean that it's, it's valuable for customers. Um, and I think we once we sort of set about trying to solve the problem, we, we qu quickly realised that... Um, to have a very, you know, fresh, up-to-date, um, accurate and, and sort of real-time data set was important. And there wasn't really a part of the bank um, that had that. Certainly the customer experience that we wanted to do around, you know, having logos, having something that was very quickly and, and easily identifiable for customers. I suppose if you're thinking about, you know, looking at your, at your mobile banking app, you, you're looking at transactions almost every time you go in there. Um, and the, 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 the data or the services that we had internally available to us just didn't quite meet the, the need in terms of the customer experience that we wanted. So we sort of did a bit of a bake-off and, and let sort of the data drive us, but, but in the end it was, it was a pretty easy decision to go down the, the look who's charging path. Wonderful. Um, and from where it started, David, now you're actually supplying a lot more, you're doing a lot more with NAB and ANZ. So from the one initial solution, now it has become a, full, a fuller partnership and in fact you're driving some of their PFM and, and mobile banking apps. Can you talk us through, and also Emily and Justin, how did that relationship and collaboration just get bigger and stronger over time? Yeah, thanks. It's, yeah, for us, it was um, a strategy we had almost from the beginning was not to um, boil the ocean, as it were. It was, we'll do one thing, we'll do it very well, um, you know, and then the business should take care of itself from there. So we were very much focused. There's lots of different use cases for our data. You mentioned PFM, but when you move through the lending space, um, you know, even before open banking, the big banks are getting a big chunk of volume internally. So categorizing that data for, um, you know, loan decisioning. Um, all the data analytics the banks are running when you come to loyalty, being able to do, you know, cash back, you know, based on the transactional data, huge number of use cases. Um, but for us, it was really, you know, finding that team, doing the one thing, doing it well, and um, sort of landing and expanding through the, the banks from there, um, which we've been very successful doing. I think with NAB and ANZ, you know, it started off with one engagement, and a couple of years later, we've probably got, you know, close to 15 plus engagements just with the two banks alone. Um, so, you, you know, there's obviously a big barrier. The, the banks are large, complex organisations juggling numerous stakeholders. You know, you're juggling regulators, government, you know, shareholders, millions of customers. Um, so there's a barrier to doing business with a bank, which is, which is understandable. Um, but that's also, I guess, can play in your favour because once you've gone through that barrier and, and you're onboarding and you're working with the bank, um, I think we, so we, we sort of never in doubt who our masters are, but it's very much felt like a partnership both with, with NAB and, and ANZ, sort of once we've gone in there, done that one thing, and you're onboarded, the information security, the procurement, the legal process, then, yeah, there uh, really is a lot of opportunities. Yeah. Mm. Um, Emily, I'm interested to hear a bit more from the bank's perspective about the procurement process and the risk socialisation, and I think you said, and the conversations internally. What does it take internally to... to, to achieve the partnership? Yeah, I mean, a lot of legwork, right? You kind of need to navigate the complex ecosystem that is um, a big bank and you've got lots of internal and external stakeholders that you need to manage, all of them with a different sort of view or lens on um, what impact you're going to surface into the area that they care about. So being able to have, like I said before, a really understandable solution and proposition actually makes that sort of internal sell job um, a lot easier. Um, it takes a lot to kind of get anything through. And that's right, you know, us, we manage a lot of money, we have a lot of customers, we've got a sort of big obligation. So, you know, all of those controls and measures are in place for good reason. But it is certainly pretty cumbersome to navigate and would feel that way, I think, externally, trying to be a supplier or partner to a big bank. Um, so I think, you know, Dave touched on it before, 
having a simple, having the kind of one thing that you do really well opens the door for the sort of next use cases, both from the supplier point of view, but also the service. You know, we trust their data, we trust the SLAs that we get. We've got, you know, direct access to Dave and Stu when something, um, you know, needs a qu query or a follow up. So I think that is kind of giving you a ticket to the game, right, to exist um, in partnership with the big bank. Thank you. And Justin, would it be similar from ANZ's perspective? Yeah, completely similar. Um, I sort of won't touch on the, the same things that you guys have talked about, but um, I, I think certainly from a from a tech perspective and and being able to um, have something that was you know almost easier to integrate with than, than some of our internal systems um, certainly made you know the the, the 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 seeds I suppose of the relationship and and getting an experience out to market you know reasonably quickly from from banks perspective at least. Um, was was something that was really good. Um, so yeah, certainly sort of echo um, the the other sentiment. But yeah, from from a tech perspective, being able to to have something that was um, you know quite simple to to integrate to, definitely sort of safe, secure, and not really sending around super sensitive you know customer identifiable information, um, which you know certainly makes it easy from a risk and compliance perspective. Was um, was something that was attractive for us. Thank you. So David, where to now? What, what's what, what, what's the you know, short, medium-term future of Look Who's Charging now? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, we, we do have lofty ambitions of growing this business internationally. Um, there's, there's been a, a lot going in Australia, which has kept us busy, and the panel before, I think, touched on some of the, you know, the resource constraints um, in, in the Australian market. But, yeah, we came together, obviously, with um, Experian Group last year, which are a large listed um, British company. Uh, so they've got, um, you know, armies of data scientists around the world and MSAs with pretty much every bank, um, bank globally, every major bank globally. So it's really leveraging that, um, you know, that network to, um, you yeah, know, take a look who's charging to other markets. Yeah. Okay, and David, if you had to summarise, uh, would you have three top tips for fintechs seeking to work with big banks? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, yeah, the, the one I touched on earlier about keeping it simple, um, it's really that elevator pitch. Um, I think we obviously had some early success with NAV, but I remember at ANZ with um, one of the, the people who worked with Justin, and we were going through the sales process, and he literally was in the elevator with Shane Elliott, the CEO of, um, of the bank at the time, and he literally gave him the elevator pitch. And with our business... In the know, elevator? In, Wonderful. In the elevator, he gave... Well, th there was a photograph, I think, as well, of them by the elevator with Shane Elliott showing the prototype. But it's a, you know, very simple problem. You can explain this business to your, you, you know, your gardener or someone you meet on the street or anyone within seconds, and they get it. Um, and it's very visual within the app. So I think keeping things simple, being able to articulate it clearly and concisely, because senior executives are busy people, right? So they need to be able to get it. So yeah, that's probably the number one tip. Um, you know, secondly, I think keep knocking on the door and it will eventually open. Banks, you know, there's 30,000, 40,000 people in the banks. Um, a, a huge number of those people, you know, are, are dedicated to, you know, the bank not messing up. Um, but there are, you know, lots of good people within those banks who do want to, you know, innovate and, and deliver, you know, uh, solutions to solve customer problems. And we've had experiences with some other banks where, you know, we've actively been told no by senior stakeholders. Well, the worst thing is never getting told, right? I think, you know, the, the UK people have, you used to be pretty good at saying no. I think when you come to Australia, you, you tend to just not get an answer, so you don't know. But, you know, we have got lots of no's. You know, with one bank, we went through 80 different stakeholders from the CEO pretty much down to the, you know, the teller on the, the tills in a branch. And over three and a half years, we completely wrote them off and then had a chance meeting at a conference and, you know, quickly went live with them afterwards. And, you know, we've got similar stories with other banks. So I think if you've got a proven business, um, you know, have the confidence, have the perseverance, keep, um, keep knocking on the doors and one will eventually open. <laughs> and Emily, from the bank perspective, any top tips for fintechs? Um, yeah, I think, Dave, it's probably your tips is why <laughs> we're in business together. Um, yeah, like, I guess if you can kind of de-risk yourself, so going back to what I said about putting on those multiple hats, like, we deal with a lot of risk partners, whether it's, you know, security advisors, fin crime like thinking about your business continuity plans, all of those things, if you can sort of have a good answer to the risk that you might present as a potential partner to a bank, then you're on the front foot already as to um, solving some of the no's that you might get internally. I think perseverance is probably also a really um, 
really important one. There's lots of people in the bank and um, seats change a bit. So when you think you've kind of got the right contact, you may not. Um, so you kind of have to keep navigating the landscape. That's definitely an important one. And I think the probably last bit is, um, you know, our core core kind of role as a bank is to lend money, to take deposits and to move money, right? So if you're kind of adding a value add on top of that, I think that's where, you know, we're not a data enrichment business, we're a sort of financial service. So I think having that kind of value add to our core um, proposition is, is where it made it really successful. Yeah. Thank you. And Justin, do you have some top tips as well for the fintechs? Oh, I think uh, you guys have covered a lot. Um, uh, definitely what I said before around, you know, integration and making it as easy as possible for, for banks and, and the tech in banks to to sort of pick up and, and use the service was was certainly something that was um, that was important to us. Um, I think as well, like just, you know, yes, keep it simple, but but start small too. So you, I'm not sure if Look Who's Charging would have said, you know, four or five years ago that, that you know, they would have had you know, did everything that's sort of now on their plate. So starting small, you know, with us or with NAB was, was definitely something that was, um, that was useful and meant that we didn't sort of have to bite off, you know, too much to start off with. Like a, a few years ago, sending, you know, data into the cloud and getting, you know, millisecond response times in your, you know, your main digital channel was something that was pretty scary for banks. Um, so starting sort of as small as we can and then building out from there um, into you know sort of what we have today is is definitely something that was was beneficial for us and um, and the relationship. Thank you. We should say um, on the Look Who's Charging website there are actually a couple of case studies that are available. Um, there's one on the NAB relationship and one on the ANZ relationship. So they're just available on the website if anyone is interested to look. Um, we do have time for, for some questions, but I know um, we're holding people up from, up from lunch, but we're very happy to take some questions. And um, Emily does have to go back to the office, but both David and Justin will be staying for lunch if you wanted to come and approach them over lunch. We might see if there are any questions from the audience. Uh, hi guys, uh, Duncan from uh, Marketa. Firstly, congratulations, uh, Dave. Uh, whenever anyone kind of mentions collaboration with uh, with, with banks, I uh, typically kind of point to, uh, uh, towards you. Um, kind of question is probably more centered around ANZ um, and you know kind of this the, the acceptance to, to use a partner that uses uh, that one of your competitor uses um, and and the sorts of you know kind of conflict that you would have had internally um, and and you know potentially David, what sort of exclusivity, you know, uh, some of your bank partners wanted to try and enforce on you. Yeah, I mean, we talked about that a bit. Um, I, I mean, I think initially when sort of Look Who's Charging started working with NAB, um, they, they sort of came to us as well and we, we weren't really sort of quite ready and, and I suppose then sort of six months later you, you sort of came back and we were probably a little bit more ready. But I think for us it, it was way more about, you know, how are we or, or what customer problem are we solving here and is Look Who's Charging a good way of doing that? Um, We'd had a bit of experience before with some other stuff that we did around, um, you know, competitor offerings and, and even sort of, you know, using logos and, and things like that, which was really important to us. Um, so it was much more around, you know, is Look Who's Charging the right way of solving, you know, the, the customer problem and delivering on the customer experience that we wanted to do um, at the time, which, which it was. So we were pretty comfortable um, from that perspective. And then I think, again, like once we, you know, spent a lot more time with sort of, you know, Dave and Stu and, and the gang at Look Who's Charging, we, we were much more comfortable um, that they were, you know, the, the right organisation to, to do what we wanted to do together. It's an interesting point you raised, Duncan. I think the conversations definitely moved on when we were first starting out four years ago. I mean, I think Reinventure were, and NAB had had the two venture arms at the time, but there were definitely some conversations with some banks, um, you know, around, you know, only work with you if we can sort of part own you, but if another bank parts own you, then this bank won't work with you. So it either felt like you need to almost take equity from everyone or from no one. Um, so I think we went down the route of taking it from, from no one to, to keep the market open. And we were open from the start that this business, you know, was about servicing, you know, we're a, we're a data company. You guys do the innovation with the user interface, et cetera. We'll do the data. But I think the conversation's definitely moved on now with sort of ANZ have obviously got their venture arm and with the stuff CBA are doing. So I think everyone's much more receptive now to 
you know, not necessarily it's kind of all or nothing from an equity perspective or working with perspective. So it's been great to see that evolve as well and hopefully, you know, good for the greater Australian fintech landscape, the banks and ultimately the end consumer. That's probably the um, you know, a selling point to it, right, Dave? Like, so now on the basis that multiple banks customers are sending that transaction data to you guys, your database gets richer. And that's kind of part of your selling point now, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the scale of the business. I think everyone benefits the, the network effect. So, you know, your customers will give feedback, which will build into the engine, and Justin's customers will benefit from that, and vice versa as well for all of our customers. So. Any more questions? We do have about another five minutes. Lunch has been pushed back if you'd like to continue as well. Thank you. Just, so Justin, I'm an ANZ customer. Is this active and live now? I don't see logos on my statements yet. I'm very jealous. Yeah, so that's that's a good question. So yes, very much live and has been live and performing very well for a, a long period of time, but only in the mobile app at the moment. So yes, we would love to bring it to um, internet banking and, and other channels, um, but at the moment it's, yes, it's mobile only. So check your ANZ app and it will be there in all its glory. <laughs> Thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> Another happy customer. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just had a question for Dave, really. Um, post look who's charging acquisition by Experian. Has that changed how you now engage and work with the banks? Well, look, I, I don't think so. We've, um, we've kept the same team of people, you know, our same infrastructure and, you know, really got some, some synergies, if anything, especially around the procurement process and contracting with, with new banks. Um, you know, say so often the, the technical integration, you know, we, we can get that done in a couple of sprint cycles with a bank. So, you know, six weeks you can get the tech integration done, but, you know, the quickest you can probably get through a procurement process with an MSA is probably three months. If you've got to do an MSA, master service arrangement, you, you're probably looking at, you know, six to nine month process potentially. Um, so I think from that perspective, yeah, it's really, um, yeah, really driven some synergies. And I think to my earlier point, if we do want to go overseas, um, you know, you'd have to, you know, try and scale up an incredible amount of resources, you know, not necessarily focusing on core product or technology, but just to navigate that process, which there should be a ready-made infrastructure for us to do that now. So. Can I just maybe add something? Just, just coming back to your point before around sort of internet banking and, and mobile, it, maybe in the past we probably would have looked at that and said, well, it's going to be harder or more complex to bring it to both channels at once and the approach there might have been to actually not do the work or, or wait until we'd solved all of that to bring it to market at both whereas it, it was actually good this time around that we said well we know that we can get something into the mobile channel and it's going to be really valuable for the three four five million customers that we have there let's let's do that first and see where it leads as opposed to waiting and trying to get sort of the nirvana across all of our digital channels so Whilst there's still, and we, we knew there would be a bit of customer pain on that one, um, it, it's still, you know, a better outcome than, than potentially waiting and, and not getting anything at all sort of over the line. Keeping me busy. <laughs> uh, I just had a question around not specifically, but around commercials and how you structure that with a bank. Uh, how do you value what you're doing and how does the ba bank value what you're bringing to them? But also around implementation charges, so the pre-live kind of costs, you know, a six-week uh, integration process and all that sort of thing. Is that, is that paid for on the bank side or is that something that you shoulder or is that now changing as you're getting more traction in the market so that the bank is more trusting of what you're going to provide to them so you're now not covering that? for future relationships? Uh, is there a variable component to API calls or is it a fixed, you know, ongoing monthly type or annual subscription to your service? Just some general points around the commercial stuff, if you don't mind. Yeah, it's a good question and it's one, look, I say, you know, none of the founders of the business had any experience dealing with banks or enterprise sales. So we were kind of learning a bit, bit on the go with that. Um, the lesson we realized pretty quick is when you're dealing with banks, though, they need a defined number. 
So you take the volume-based approach or anything that's variable when they're trying to get a purchase order raised, you know, for the next 12 months. If it could be anything from here to here, it makes it much more complex with a bank. Um, so, you know, it's picking a number, you know, that's, that's reasonable for both parties. And, you know, we had a cost out um, associated, you know, calls out the cost center, et cetera. But I think if you're a fintech, though, your costs to serve are relatively low. You know, banks are used to working with big organizations, and the fees are, you know, probably pretty large as a result of that. Um, so, you know, we got, you know, what we thought was some very generous commercials agreed, and I think the banks probably thought they were getting, you know, extremely sort of generous fees as, as well. Um, but we took the approach of, yeah, it's a sort of fixed, fixed fee, so everyone has the certainty as to what it is. Our, our costs do have a bit of variability, but not a hu huge amount, so we were able to sort of take that approach. And, you know, COVID, et cetera, has really, um, you know, increased the volumes that have come through those organizations. Um, but we do, if we're working with a neo bank or a startup bank, then we look to do something, um, you know, that scales a bit more. Um, but we kind of stray away from a volume-based approach and look to, you know, do sort of a, a fee that scales up with their sort of projected growth plans. Um, and look, the implementation point is, um, is a good one. Um, so look, that did, that was great for our business originally because, you know, we bootstrapped the business. Um, but fortunate we were able to get some traction with NAB and, you know, some of those fees give you the working capital you need to really get to market. Um, and I think people are, you know, certainly big organizations are, are used to sort of paying that fee for that support, um, you know, up to the go live, go live um, period as well. So, but very much I think that recurring, you know, monthly sort of subscription model is, is how we've approached our business. So. Wonderful. Well, I think if there are no more questions, or well, do we have one more? Oh, sorry. Yep, go for it. I'll make it quick. Uh, Lizzie Condon from MasterCard. So you've spoke heavily about some of your experiences with working uh, with the traditional banks and some of the larger players. I'd be keen to understand if, uh, well, the differences in working with some of the new digital banks. Um, I, I can assume what we'd hope that the implementation would be maybe easier, but yeah, any other differences that you can speak to for these new entrants? Oh, look, it's, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting one. Um, look, I think the, you know, the theory, I mean, if you, you speak to Stuart, the theory of an API is you shouldn't need a person, right? If you integrate with Google's APIs, you know, you jump on the website, you get the spec in a sandbox and off you go. Um, but understandably, you know, there is a process of supporting, um, supporting banks. But, you know, whether it's neo bank or startup bank versus established banks, we've worked with some established banks who've, albeit they've joined later than NAB and ANZ, so a lot of the teething issues have been solved. So, you know, there was a large second tier bank we had one phone call with and they were live, you know, a couple of weeks later. Um, there's been some neo banks that we spent three years whiteboarding stuff with, right? So I wouldn't necessarily say it's, um, yeah, it's perhaps, a, you know, big bank versus startup bank. Um, yeah, it's more, I guess, the customer you're, you're working with and at what point they're starting to work with us. I think most customers that join us now, it's, um, yeah, it's a pretty smooth process for, you know, one of the tried and tested <laughs> use cases, right? Great, well thank you so much to the panel. Um, I think we've got some gifts for you over on the left and then let's, let's all head to lunch. Right. And we'll see you back here at one. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.